It's Mo. It is Bookmas. Bookmas week three and we are starting our week three vlog. Actually I started this vlog a little while ago but I didn't get to check in with you until now so I'm checking in here. It is week three of the Cloak and Dagger Christmas. It is week three of Bookmas. And I did want to address that technically the Christie's Missing readathon is over. It ended on the 13th, which was Monday, because those were the days that Christie went missing. So Agatha Christie famously went missing for a short while in her lifetime, and no one knows where she was, and no one knows where she went, and it's a great mystery among mystery lovers. That's what the readathon was inspired by. So while that only lasted from the 3rd to the 13th, I am going to, of course, continue the Christie's Missing readathon longer than that. I only ended up reading one book for that, which was And Then There Were None, but I do plan on reading some other books for that as well. One of those, one that I really want to get to is Well Met. This is a contemporary romance. It was written a few years ago, and I've only heard good things about it. It was written in 2019. After reading a couple of contemporary romances this year, I think that maybe that's a genre that I enjoy. I don't like contemporary mystery thrillers that much, especially not in the Ruth Ware, Colleen Hoover kind of vein, but I do kind of like the romances that I've read, so I definitely want to try this one. This would fit the romance prompt for Christie's Missing. Christie's Missing. All of the last video I <laughs> list through Christie's Missing. Missing. Christie's Missing. It's very hard for me to say. I want to say Christie's Missing. I am also still working on Cloak and Dagger Christmas. I am currently reading Dracula on audio. I am really enjoying it. It has this aspect that I find really interesting that I didn't remember, which is like friendship and humanity seeing humanity in others and trying to show your humanity to others. I'm really enjoying the friendships, Mina's friendship with Lucy and how that is a driving force in both of their lives in a lot of way, how they inspire each other, how they confide in each other. And then Van Helsing, who we have now met, who is a great lawyer and psychologist and immunologist and occultologist. He so deeply wants to find connection. You don't really know what happened to his wife, but you know that his baby son died. He sees in each young person that he is involved with, in with Lucy, with Lucy's betrothed Arthur, with Jonathan, with Mina. He sees himself and the potential that he had as a young man that was not allowed to continue. So he sees in Arthur what he imagines his son could have grown up to be like, and he sees in Mina what the relationship of man and wife could have been if that had continued for him. That is just such an interesting aspect of the story that I definitely didn't remember and I don't think is talked about a lot. The idea of meeting someone and having a kinship with them almost immediately. The idea of leaning on your friends and helping each other through hard times. Themes of brotherly love and humane love. It seems like Dracula certainly gets pegged in a erotic kind of area a lot of times, partly because of Dracula's brides, partly because the nature of vampires tends to be intimate and erotic to a certain degree, no matter what you do, and there are elements of that, but I think like the humane love and the, the brotherly love, the love of mankind and of fellow 
humans is very important in this. Interesting things. Anyway, so I am reading Dracula. Well, I also started Dead Man's Float by Beth Sherman. This is the first book in the Jersey Shore Mystery, and I'm reading this for Cloak and Dagger Christmas. It does not fit any of the Christie's Missing prompts, and neither does Dracula. This one is about our main character, Anne Hardaway, and she has lived on the Jersey Shore her entire life. She has had opportunity to leave and she has had reason to leave, but she's never taken that. A high school contemporary of hers who she had a big crush on comes back to town and he is ostracized by the town. He was accused of a crime that Although he was never even charged with that crime, everyone th in the town thinks he did. Now, the town of Oceanside Heights is a small town. It's gossipy. Everyone knows everyone, and everyone knows dirt on everyone. Anne really identifies with Tigger, who was her childhood crush, because she's been ostracized by the town as well. Her mother had early onset Alzheimer's and it was at a time in the 70s and 80s before that was really understood and the townspeople just labeled her mom as crazy and they kind of label Anne as crazy as well. She is also semi-ostracized from the town and this is one of the reasons that it would be easy for her to leave her home, but she never has done that. Tigger left after the crime that he was accused of and now he's back because his mother has recently died. Anne still has these images of him as a kid and the feelings of crushing that she had when they were in high school. She also has a lot of sympathy for him because of how he's treated in the town. They go out to dinner and have a nice time, and while they're at dinner, Tigger lets her know that he has gotten a death threat. The town folk have been extremely cruel to him, but this was a real threat, and he's worried about the potential that this is a real possibility of danger for him. And she kind of blows him off. She's like, the town is cruel. I've been here forever. I know that better than anyone, but they're harmless. Unfortunately, after she sends him home to his boarding house, the next morning she wakes up to find that he has drowned in the sea. She is already suspicious of this when his brother shows up and claims that it was not suicide and it was certainly not an accident. They start to investigate this case together. I will stop there. It is Thursday, December 16th, and we are about to go out. We're going to go to a park. It's supposed to be really nice today. It looks kind of gray out and not super nice, but it's supposed to be like in the 60s and we're gonna go meet my mom and go for a walk in a park because my mom is still shielding. Also on the list is chores and errands. This week is definitely, I think, going to be about like hearty, delicious, winter eating because I'm trying to get back into cooking more and I'm trying to get back into using all the food that I buy and not letting anything go to waste. I feel like this is a constant cycle for me where I get really good at meal planning. Not even really good at meal planning, but I meal plan a little bit. I plan out what I'm going to make. I buy what I need for that stuff and then I use it. That is the up part of the cycle and then the down part of the cycle is that I just go to the supermarket, buy random stuff, don't eat it, don't cook it, it goes to waste, it goes in the compost or it goes in the garbage and I feel really bad about myself and we end up eating a lot of junk food. And then I'll get back on that up cycle. So I would love, especially in the new year, to kind of maintain that up cycle, to get better at planning meals, making sure that I cook them, eating leftovers, making sure that we always have really good, nutritious, wholesome, plant-based food in the house that we can eat, and then sometimes eat junk food too. I mean, we're gonna go get an egg and cheese sandwich right now, so it's not like, it's not like we don't, we're not still eating junk, but we're on an up cycle and I'm happy about it.
is December 19th and here I am. I haven't been able to film a lot of like speaking to you clips in this week's vlog, but I'm hoping to chat a little today and let you know how I'm doing with my reading. I'm still listening to Dracula on audio. I'm about 60 two percent of the way through the audiobook and I'm still really liking it. It does depart from the story that I'm more familiar with which is probably an amalgamation of memory, bad memory, and the movie that was made in the 90s. Just the myth and cultural osmosis of Dracula. So it is already surprising me and we are at the point where all our characters are coming together. Lucy's suitors, her fiance Arthur, her doctor friend, her American friend, and Van Helsing are all together. And then we have the Harkers, Mina and Jonathan Harker are uh, reunited. They've been married. They have decided that they need to do something about this Dracula problem. They are contacted by Van Helsing and now all these players are coming together and we're going to seek out Dracula. One problem that I realize with this book is that I can't really fit it in the Cloak and Dagger Christmas prompt for set in a different country if I'm counting America and England, which I think I should be. So I can't really count this one, unfortunately, because it does mostly take place in England. I thought it mostly took place in Transylvania. There's some elements of it in Transylvania, but it mostly takes place in England. At the end of all these vlogs, we'll go over what prompts everything fits in. I also finished Dead Man's Float by Beth Sherman. I love a cozy mystery because they're super quick to get through. They're easy to read. They don't challenge you with a lot of different ideas and uh, heavy topics, but obviously they do have some heavy topics because they deal with murder and murderers generally. I've only read two in the series, but this series of books, from what I can tell, does have elements or potential elements of having more interesting, deeper conversations. I think you can tell from this book that this person does think about some deeper questions and some deeper elements that are touched on in her books. She talks a lot about the character's mother having early onset Alzheimer's and how that was stigmatized and how that affected not only the mom's life but the main character's life, how it affected our main character's parents, how it affected their marriage, how it affected the way the town looks at her and how she is by default stigmatized as well uh, because her mom was crazy. It's got some interesting elements of that. It is not super explored in these books. It's definitely like a part of the character development of our main character Anne and it definitely does affect and color all the decisions that she makes and the emotions and way that she looks at the world. Another element that's touched on and has been touched on in both these books is the idea of poverty and where poverty can lead you and that it can lead you to things like drug abuse and sex work and theft and things like that and how that is a systemic problem. I'm, again, I'm sure the author was not intending to illuminate these ideas or really think about these ideas too much, but it is interesting that the town that this is set in, Oceanside Heights, is, you know, very rich, very religious, very strict, very stern, very proper. And right next door is Lansdowne, which had been a similar town to Oceanside Heights at one point, but because they have more people in poverty, it has slid down into disorder and decay and crime. So the people living there are considered very, very different from the people in Oceanside Heights, and they're looked down upon. But I think that the author and our main character never looks down on the people. I think it's made clear that many people in the town do. Many people disregard the people who live in Lansdowne 
and think of them just as a criminal element, whereas I think Anne understands that they are just people in different circumstances than her own, and she feels lucky and privileged to be in better circumstances. So I think there is like, there's an interesting idea of that too, of the dichotomy of how one town can flourish and another town can fail. And then of course, it's super interesting because that's the town that I live in. I live in Lansdowne. Lansdowne is Asbury Park. Ocean Heights is Ocean Grove, New Jersey. So there is real historic precedence for everything that she's saying, not everything, for many of the things that she's saying, because it is true that both of those towns started in a similar way with a lot of religious connotation, and both of those towns diverge greatly on how they were gathering their community and also how they were bringing in tourists. They diverge greatly in that Ocean Grove is a dry town, so there's no selling of alcohol, and alcohol wasn't permitted for many years, whereas Asbury Park became a place where people could go and buy booze. There were race riots here, and there was um, a huge discrepancy of wealth, and still is, and there was a huge divide between the black population and the poor population and the BIPOC population and the white rich population. There is a lot to think about in modern day, even though these books were written in the late 90s, because they do reflect things that are still going on, things that happened in the actual past of these places, and things that are still going on. They are fiction, and they are definitely fictionalized, and they're definitely made to be convenient for the author in a lot of ways. Oceanside Heights is very different than Ocean Grove. There's not nearly as many things in Ocean Grove as there are in Oceanside Heights. There's not a big town that she kind of talks about, but some of the elements are there. She talks about the mini mark, the mini mark's still there. She talks about the amusement park between Lansdowne and Oceanside Heights, and we still have the casino, which you can see in a lot of those clips that I post of the sunrises, uh, that kind of walk through building big building is the casino, and that was at some point an amusement park. You can see a lot of what still exists, and you can see how someone would idealize that or would make it convenient for them to write about. I definitely think these are, they're not overly violent. I mean, obviously there are murders, but the murder scenes or death scenes are not super gory or graphic. They're not super scary. They're very unrealistic in a lot of ways. And they're super easy to guess what happens. I knew right away who the murderer was. They have two sides. They're super easy to guess, but also they don't really give you enough clues to guess who it is. So you're, you're actually just guessing by the tone of the book and by having read a lot of cozy mysteries. They're fun. They're quick. I like them. I have the, the second one, so I read the third one first, the first one second, and then I'll read the second one third. Then I did start reading Well Met. I am 64 pages in, so, you know, read the first few chapters, but I'm not going to talk too much about it right now. What I do want to say is that I feel like my reading in the last few months has gotten slower and also gotten more piecemeal. One of the reasons and one of the ways that I was able to rekindle and restart my reading in 2020 was because I was, in the very beginning of 2020, chatting with my friend Matt, and Matt is a big reader, and he has a method that he uses for reading that is very, very simple. I started adopting that method for reading, and basically it's just reading a certain number of pages every day. Instead of reading two pages, seven pages, and twelve pages, you read like a set number of pages when you sit down to read. Now, you can't always do this, but that's the goal, right? So keeping that goal in mind was something that helped me spur on my reading, it helped me standardize my reading. Previous to 2020, when I read, I would read like three pages. I'd read like five pages. I never got immersed in the books enough to get through the books, one, in a timely manner, but also in a manner that kept me captivated, kept me interesting, because I would forget what I read, and then I have to go back, I wouldn't read for four or five days, and using Matt's method and using the time that I had in 2020 to be able to really sit down, read a chunk of pages, 30, 50, 100 pages at a time, or 
have that always be my goal, if not for that session, then for the day, I was able to really standardize my reading and that really kept me captivated, kept me engaged in the books that I was reading and helped me read more. I feel like in the last few months I haven't been doing that and that's when my reading has gone down. Another thing that I've realized that I've started doing is reading a lot of books at once. I always have an audiobook going and a physical book going, which is great because I listen to the audiobook when I can't be physically reading and I physically read when I can be. But if I have, oops, if I have two or three books going at the same time, then I'm not as engaged in each one. So I'm not paying attention the way I need to be to each physical book if I have two or three physical books going. Occasionally I'll have more than one audiobook going too because maybe like I'll be listening to one at work and then I'll be listening to one with my husband or something like that. That's okay but like the more I spread out my reading investment and my reading attention span, the less quickly I'm reading and the less invested I'm reading. We're just going to keep using those words because I'm not, I don't have a lot of words today. That is something that I've noticed and that is something that I am actively working towards changing this month and I'll catch up with you when I read some more or I want to clue you in to anything else. <laughs>